Now, this week isn't exactly rocket science. It's a pretty simple equation. Michael plus Alistair plus Blue Nun equals on-screen chemistry. <laughs> Yet Albert Einstein actually claimed politics was more difficult than physics. I suppose the existence of the Miliband brothers disproves the theory of relativity. <laughs> John Prescott disproves the theory of evolution. Alistair Campbell's diaries disprove the theory of accurate recall. That is not true. And Michael Portillo's quiff disproves the theory of gravity. <laughs> but we decided it was time to test the hypothesis, put political science under this week's microscope. <laughs> Eureka! After 50 years of predict and seek, the Higgs boson particle has finally been found. And the British professor who began the search couldn't hide his joy. Well, I would like to add my congratulations to everybody involved in this tremendous achievement. Uh, for me, it's really an incredible thing that has happened in my lifetime. The Prime Minister was quick to congratulate the team at CERN and dismiss accusations that science isn't given the respect or money it deserves. It's a very big step forward. We should congratulate everyone involved. This government's commitment to the science budget is without any doubt, not least because while we've had to make difficult cuts, we preserve the science budget. But with only a single member of parliament coming from a science background, are our politicians failing to understand the world around them? Perhaps with geek chic more fashionable than ever, we need a scientific revolution in Westminster, as well as the laboratory. It's like, it's like saying, we want to explore that ocean, but we don't know where the land is that we want to explore. We've now found the land. We know in which direction to go. So we don't know what's on that land yet. It's an undiscovered country in many ways. But at least we know where it is. Professor Cox is with us now. Welcome to, to this week's studio. Now, look, it's been a great week for scientists. I understand the excitement. But explain to us, simpletons, why we, particularly these two, who are very simple, why would you be excited? I just put in a warning. It's late at night. Most of our audience are drunk. <laughs> very simply, <laughs> the, the theory is that empty space isn't empty. It's rammed full of these things called Higgs particles. And we get our mass. So the particles that make up everything in the universe, your hand, this table, everything you can see, get their mass, get their solidity by bouncing off the Higgs particles, which sounds like a very bizarre thing to say, mm. except that we now know that's correct. Who could ever have thought that was the case? Well, uh, Peter Higgs and a few no, others. I, no, I but, get uh, that. But the, the re Why would you ever think it's, that? It's very <laughs> well, it's a very interesting question philosophically because it was a mathematical prediction oh. based on, I suppose, an aesthetic judgment about the equations that we had that describe how the universe works. So it's one of the best examples, if not the best I know, of what a very famous physicist, Wigner, called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. So it's not known why an aesthetic sense about mathematics should be a guide to reality. But in this case, I mean, you think about it, it's not only the fact that we found that the vacuum of space is full of Higgs particles, but 88 countries from around the world built the most most complex machine ever built to go and test that hypothesis and found it to be true. Now, David Cameron immediately launched a congratulatory statement. Um, do you think he had any idea what he was congratulating the science community about? I, I don't know. I suspect there's been a lot of it in the press. But it's, it's, a, it's a very positive time, actually, because, I mean, as you mentioned in the introduction, the, the British, the Britain has not been great. Oh, certainly its political class has not been great at understanding science mm. or promoting it or even to some extent supporting it. I mean, we are one of the lowest spending countries in terms of R&D and yet we're one of the most successful countries in I terms of I think we have the, the best science, science minister that Britain has ever had in David Sainsbury. I think, well, he doubled the science budget and, and that was a... a, a contributions to the Labour Party. Too. Tremendously <laughs> needed. <laughs> we can do with them now. <laughs> um, it doesn't worry you, though, because it would seem to me it is a cause for worry that there is an almost total lack of scientific knowledge in the commons. Uh, only one MP has worked in science. 
You know, there, there are many reasons why that's bad. I mean, one of them is that policy should be based on evidence. And what you're essentially talking about there is the scientific method. Mm -hmm. But the other reason that it's bad is because uh, I think the number is something like 43, 44% of our GVA, essentially our GDP, is based on knowledge intensive services and industry, mm -hmm. which rests on the university sector, which rests on the science budgets. And so that train through the economy, the, the, the route to growth, I would contend, rests on the university sector mm -hmm. and on the research budgets and the science budget. And if people don't back that philosophically and politically, then we're in trouble. 27% of Conservative MPs have previously worked in banking and accountancy. There's a shock. None in science. That's pretty shocking, is it not? Yeah, it's... it's Does it's medicine count? It's very disappointing. We did, we did once Good produce point. a Prime Minister who was qualified. Yes, a chemist. And, <laughs> a chemist. Um, but, I, but I do think it's extraordinary, nonetheless, that this Hadron Collider has been constructed. I mean, this is an immensely complex an expensive machine which has required the cooperation of governments around the world and don't you think it's remarkable that there was the foresight there was the understanding across the planet that this had to be done well CERN was set up in the 1950s uh, mm. by international treaty as one of the projects that would unify Europe after the war in the pursuit of knowledge for peaceful means it's been protected by international treaty ever since but in fact it's not as expensive as, as people think CERN's entire budget out of which it built the Large Hadron Collider is less than the budget of a medium-sized European university. So what you're really talking about is one yeah. extra university in the world mm. that does an, a unique thing, which is to explore the early universe. Who's, 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 gonna, who's gonna win the Nobel Prize then? It's a great question. I would expect there'll be a British Nobel Prize there. It could well be Peter Higgs. But actually, the people that designed and, and built that machine, a lot of them, the teams were led by British physicists. Mm. There's, a, there's a man called Lynn Evans, who was the, the overseer of that project, who would have a good claim to it as well. Maybe. Do you think the harsh truth is that if um, scientists are to have the same access to Downing Street as bankers, you're just going to have to donate more money to political parties? We've spent more money Sick. on bailing out the banks in one year than we spent on science in Britain since Jesus. Is, is that right? really? <laughs> That's true. And look what we did with that. We invented the industrial world. So I think just a drip of that quantity of easing into the uh, science budget would possibly you can transform get it to our economy. Anytime once. And why do you stand for Parliament? I, well, you, I, 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 not, not much happens then, does it? I, mean, I, 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 I think you've got to. Don't you have, don't you have, to, be, term in the House don't you have to be Prime Minister at least until well, you here, can get anything an, done? Here's in, an interesting issue, though. The, David Sainsbury did, though. The only, si yeah, and he was a Lord. The mm. only scientific knowledge in Parliament is in the House of Lords, mm -hmm. and it's going to be an interesting feature of Lords reform mm -hmm. that when we move to choosing it by a party list system. Mm -hmm. Uh, a party list that, on a regional basis. All the, all the, on a regional, all that scientific knowledge will go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It makes now, you the, think. Now, the, the, the House of Lords reform is a catastrophe. It is an absolute catastrophe. And the worst of it is, as you say, the method that has been chosen for the election, which is the one that hands all the power to the political parties and removes all power from the voters. I think the plan's been lobotomised a bit. I, I, the plan is you a stand disgrace. stand on the plan. On the plan? Yeah. Not, not, not a great fan. You're not. No, I've never been a great fan of the Lords full stop. You might be easier uh, just to get rid of it. You think? Well, I, I think that with all the, I think if you had proper devolution around Britain and you, Europe treated properly with a proper partnership with Britain, you could have a very, very strong House of Commons and have a completely different system. But th that idea is not even on the I agenda. But under the present system that you have for the House of Commons, it is open to people of scientific knowledge to offer themselves for Parliament. Yeah. So you know, it's all very well blaming Parliament or blaming the Conservative Party for not having scientists. But you've also got to think about it the other way. You know, it is open to scientists to put themselves forward. Mm. You might speak based on evidence, and that would make it very difficult to get elected. How, <laughs> I mean, is, 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 that's a good point. Is, is British science on, on a bit of a roll at the moment? I mean, are we doing well? Are we that famous foreign office phrase? Are we punching above our weight? Well, undoubtedly, but every statistic you look at tells us that we're the most efficient scientific nation in the world by a long way, although we spend less on science than virtually every other major nation as a percentage of GDP. But just to give you an example, we won two Nobel Prizes in physics uh, mm. two years ago at the University of Manchester for the discovery of this thing, graphene, which could yes. well revolutionise the 21st century. And to the government's credit, it's just put around 50 million into graphene research and into the bridge between that and industry. So I think David Cameron is not entirely, I don't know, speaking but, fictitiously when he says that he's back in science, there is some evidence now that, that it's beginning to seek, sink in. Does mean that our universities, which obviously face great competition from the much better funded American universities and elsewhere and the rise of Chinese universities in the Far East, 
Are our universities still holding their own in scientific endeavor? Oh, yeah. If you, if you look at the, the Shanghai ratings, which are the, the yeah. commonly accepted yeah. list, we do very well indeed. And, and it's because, I think it's because you can't buy a university system. You know, it, it rests on hundreds of years, actually, of, 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 of strong foundations. And we've got that. It's one of the great assets of this country, and we need to protect it. That's fine. And we've had a lot of praise for science, quite rightly. But I have a bone to pick with you. When I was a kid, science held out the prospect for me of a jet pack, and yeah. I've still not got one. What went wrong? You can get those. <laughs> well, you can. You can. We even know to do teleportation, at least at a subatomic level. That's what it is. Tele badly. Deportation. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> teleportation. <laughs> Instant <laughs> deportation. Oh, was that be beam me <laughs> up, <laughs> Scotty? <laughs> yeah, back up there. <laughs> so so you tell me we, we, we could have a jet pack now? We've got jet packs. Yeah, they're just not very practical. <laughs> I, I don't care <laughs> about that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dream. And we're really... Cl I, mean, re I mean, the one thing when I saw Star Trek, I thought, the one thing you'll never have is teleportation. Yeah, we, we can do that. At a subatomic level, it's been done so over just a little, big distances. Just a little way to go. Yes. We've got to build it up now. <laughs> Brian, great to have you on the show. Thank it's you very pleasure. much for being with us tonight. That's your lot for tonight, folks.